Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Wreck 3 Genesis, a Spanish film released in 2012. The original Wreck is one of the best found footage films ever made, and its sequel, Wreck 2, gave us more of the same in both style and setting. Wreck 3 switches everything up on us, though it begins with found footage from a bunch of cameras recording a wedding. 20 minutes in, it switches to a more traditional cinematic style, as it follows the bride and groom trying to reunite with one another among a horde of demon zombies. Although maybe they should just be happy they were able to get married in the first place. Thanks to COVID, we had to move our wedding to June of next year. Aside from my own wedding date, I'm totally cool when it comes to switching things up and trying something new. So the fact that this threequel ditches the trademark found footage style was an intriguing change to me. It was a decision by Paco Plaza, who co-directed the first two films with John Jaume Balaguerro, but who went stag to create Rec 3. After Rec 2, the filmmakers decided on a sort of shared custody situation, with Plaza directing Rec 3 while Balaguerro made Rec 4. Plaza aimed to make something adventurous this time, with a consciously anti-Rec style, using lots of big, fluid tracking and crane shots. Again, I think it's cool to try something new, but unfortunately, I'm not a huge fan of drawn-out plots where two characters spend the whole time looking for each other. Full disclosure though, it's possible my ambivalence towards this movie comes from the impossible kill counting I had to do. Unlike the Barcelona apartment building, which had a very limited number of victims inside, this wedding is freaking huge and full of infected people running around. And because I count infected people as kills in this franchise, that left me with one messy fucking count. Which is part of the reason I have a sponsor for today's episode. Y'all already know how much I love Manscaped and their Perfect Package Essentials Kit to keep everything below this camera frame nice and tidy. The centerpiece of that package for your package is the Lawnmower 3.0, a waterproof and cordless body trimmer. This thing's even got a light, so you can use it to watch out for demon zombies while you're keeping yourself properly groomed. You can get 20% off the Perfect Package Essentials Kit and free shipping with the code KILLCOUNT at manscaped.com. That's promo code KILLCOUNT at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping. How many people will be parted when death collects its dues? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a DVD menu. I love this framing device, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense. What, someone went through the process of making a DVD after this disaster of a wedding? Oh well, it's still kind of fun. It's the big day for Coldo, who's meeting and greeting all his family and friends, including best man, Rapscallion Rafa. Oye. Si grabas alguna tía buena, me avisas, ¿vale? Rafa's talking to one of this movie's found footage camera operators, Coldo's cousin, Adrian. Our other main cam op is this pro with a stabilizer, Atun, whose footage is quite an upgrade from the camcorder quality we're used to. Thanks, Atun. You're a good guy. Another little cam op running around is Tita, the younger sister of Coldo's wife-to-be, Clara, who's got something on her mind besides her upcoming vows. Tita. Apaga la cámara. Tengo que contar todo. Coldo talks with his uncle Pepe Victor, a jovial chap who's sporting a bandage on his hand. He works at an animal clinic, and a dog there bit him. I'm sure it's totally fine, though. The last few characters we meet as the ceremony gets started are a bunch of Rafa's rowdy friends, the so-called Peña del Perón. I thought they'd be zany characters we'd get to follow throughout this adventure, but sadly, most of them fall by the wayside. Damn, really wanted to get to know guy who does three open mics every weeknight and spend Spanish Seth Rollins over there. El Mesias del Lunes por la Noche, if you will. Father Losada marries Coldo y Clara, and after some ring fingering, a couple of vows, and a kiss, the two of them are joined in holy matrimony. Aw, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and ironic. Everyone gives their congrats to the newlyweds, including Koldo's hearing aid wearing grandpa. And then it's off to the reception we go. <laughs> there certainly are, Adrian. There certainly are. Lots of people and a sponge person. <laughs> Someone might want to get a real sponge for Tio Pepe Victor, though. He's looking like he's about to have a flop sweat. Clara tries to tell Koldo something important, but doesn't get the chance to before their entrance music plays and they head into the reception. Shell 
Klaus and I might do a Sami Zayn Shinsuke entrance for ours. I'll skank all up and down that room, man. Though we know disaster awaits them, it's nice to see how in love Clara and Koldo are. Both actors, Leticia Dolera and Diego Martin, do a great job establishing that passion in the little time they get. It's hard for me to know what other roles of actors are notable when I'm talking about film industries outside the US, but American viewers may have caught a glimpse of Ms. Dolera in the second episode of Penny Dreadful. She was an attendee of that seance where Ava Green went buck wild. She's also apparently married to director Paco Plaza, though they never mentioned that in the behind the scenes stuff I watched. During the reception, we meet the guy hired to entertain kids dressed like, uh, Spongebob, right? Bueno, a ver, es que hubo un tema con los derechos y ahora el disfraz es de John Esponja. Y que quede bien claro que estamos hablando de un personaje que no tiene nada que ver con ese al que tú te refieres, eh? que sí. a ver si luego voy a tener yo problemas. Sí. John Sponge and Adrian see the sick Tio puking, and they'd better hope that guy's just had one too many Bloody Marys. Something about all those people in hazmat suits over there tells me that's not the case, though. Inside, the reception's proceeding as planned, with Clara and Coldo doing a choreographed couples dance that the actors actually had to learn in real life. It was one of many ways the production tried to make the wedding feel as authentic as possible, which brought an element of joy to the movie that was never really present in the first two films. Que muchas veces olvidábamos todos, sobre todo los actores, que estábamos rodando una película. Yo me acuerdo los momentos en que rodábamos las partes del convite y del baile, Aquello se convirtió en una boda real. To make sure everyone there looked the part, director Paco Plaza personally helped cast all the wedding guest extras alongside casting director Ana Isabel Velázquez, who actually played the Colombian woman in the first two Rex. Velázquez was one of many people behind the scenes who returned from Rex 1 and 2. Art director Hema Faria came back as well, excited to do something other than create a creepy penthouse. This time around, she got to pick out flowers and a color palette for an entire damn wedding. Editor David Gaillard, who cut the first two films, similarly got to expand his horizons by getting to work with a lot of different footage taken by people at the wedding. He and Plaza worked together to determine just how much of the movie should take place before the infection broke out, knowing they had to balance the immersion of experiencing this event with the excitement of getting to the horror, which we're just about to get to, as soon as Rafa seals up his seduction of a French woman named Natalie. That's the kind of footage you want to get on camera. Oh, and speaking of which, check out the drunk uncle up on the banister like he's Tim Curry Pennywise. Quick, get a good shot before- oh, never mind. We've got a drunkle down. I repeat, a drunkle down! Uncle Pepe Victor becomes our first victim on the count when he's revealed to be infected. And though he's biting out his wife's neck there, whenever I can, I wait for the infection to show before I add people to the list. Gotta show surefire signs like puking up blood, you know? Or jumping through screens like these couple of infected dudes do. Looks like they're policia from outside. Shit goes nuts, but the only infected people I see at first are one dude who jumps downstairs with a roar and an infected woman who we see eating someone's neck on the ground. Amidst the chaos, Clara is pulled in the opposite direction of her brand new husband, who winds up in the kitchen with a larger group of people, and an infected male wedding guest trying to get inside. Once again, makeup effects on the infected zombie demons were done by David Ammit. He applied his by now well-honed artistry to stunt performers who worked under stunt coordinator Luis Rivera to do all this crazy jumping and running around. Helps that a lot of them were young parkour dudes, like a guy named Yosua who did that two-story jump from the balcony. God damn! This is obviously a crazy time to keep the camera rolling, but Atun gives us the justification we need for us to have a found footage film. What is this? The people have the right to know what's going on. Yeah, that's right, Atun. Oh, wait, that's not right, Atun. According to Coldo, he says that's insane and breaks the camera on the ground, which leads to an extremely late in the game title card. Jeez, what's this movie think it is? The Friday the 13th remake? With our regular wreck perspective, corrective? On the floor, broken and dead, we switch into full on movie mode, complete with a non diegetic score composed by Mikael Salas. 
This break from the franchise's style gave yet another returning crew member the chance to do something different, as cinematographer Pablo Rosso now got to work with a big ol' Ari Alexa camera, and also didn't have to run around as a character behind the lens. Good for him! Our first cinematic kills to go on the count are two kitchen workers found infected in the back, who are then locked behind a sliding door. Just two though, right? Maybe this isn't going to be as difficult as I- OH COME ON! Fuck man, there's like 16 people in this shot, I think? They're either stumbling around like they're infected or lying motionless getting eaten, so let's put them all on the list. And yeah, maybe some of the people in that shot are infected folk I've already counted. We're just gonna have to learn to live with that uncertainty, alright? Coldo wants to go find Clara, but they're pretty cornered in the kitchen, and with an infected woman trying to get in, they turn to a grill on the floor as a means of escape. Too bad this moncho dude messes things up and causes the multi-tool to fall through the slats. With the infected woman outside, joined by three infected dudes, the kitchen crew turns to an air duct to get them out. Well, most of them. Atun tells them to go ahead without him, but Adrian promises to come back for him later. Thumbs up to that little buddy. Thumbs up. They climb through the duct using camcorder night vision as an homage to the first two films, and when they reach the end, they see a topless woman wandering around, obviously infected. That, or she just really lets go at receptions. After climbing out, they also see an infected woman chasing down a guest at the party, and then an infected man, an infected woman, and and two infected indiscernibles running along the terrace. They reach a cop car as another infected dude jumps down from a balcony, only to find the police officer inside not moving. But this lady is! She's missing an eye and infected as all hell. Adrian saves his primo from her attack, and Moncho finally makes himself useful by beating the woman down with a car jack, and making sure she stays down too. While trying to figure out the car's radio, Moncho is bitten and killed by the infected police officer waking up from his nappy nap. I'm counting Moncho now since I don't think we ever see him infected later. I'll also count the infected woman and two infected dudes who then come out and- oh, wait a minute, six infected dudes who then come out and chase away Coldo and Co. The heroes run through the woods until they get to a mausoleum, where they see one more infected woman from afar. I think we saw her getting attacked a little earlier, but now she's confirmed infected. They're led into the crypt by Coldo's grandmother, who tells them the infected are unable to get inside this holy sanctuary. Unfortunately for Coldo, Although Clara is not among the people taking refuge here, but her voice does come over a speaker system telling him she's alright. Sensing that he's okay too, she takes this opportunity to finally tell him what's been on her mind all day. Coldo resolves to save his wife and unborn child, and to protect himself for this mission, he turns to some handy holy armor. Clara is in the building's command center with Father Losara, who prattles off about biblical end times as security cam footage shows us 25 more infected or dying people. Once again, there's a decent chance some of these people were already counted. Once again, doesn't really matter, just go with it. The zombie demon danger arrives in person when an infected woman leads a charge that turns Clara into Wendy Torrance as they break in through the door. I see her and five other infected dudes coming in behind her. Y eso no es todo! There are another five infected people trying to get in to where Clara and El Padre are. Wow, zombie and infection movies are real hard to count, y'all. Coldo and a worker named Danilo run around in St. George's armor, which is just a shade too goofy to me, especially coupled with the choral music on the soundtrack. The armor, which costume designer Olga Rodal had to get from Germany, was pretty heavy and uncomfortable, so Coldo's actor Diego Martin was also not a fan. Casco infernal con el que no veo absolutamente nada. They hide from an infected lady stumbling around outside, and as they do, they miss Clara and Father Losara using a fire hose to get down to the floor below them. They come across Rafa, French kissing that Natalie woman, both of them completely oblivious to what's happened at the reception. Sir Coldo and his Sancho Panza are just about at the command center when Danilo is dragged out of a window and killed, his shield sliding out to punctuate his fate. 
Too bad Clara's not even in the control room anymore. She's too busy slut-shaming Natalie as they try to avoid infected people like the two down the hall behind them or the one who pops up in front of them and gets a pool cue in the face for his efforts. Their escape downstairs is blocked by a background infected dude and two foreground infected women, including Pepe Victor's wife, Anton Paro, who was bit earlier. In the mirror, the women look like Tristana Medeiros, once again played by Javier Botet, and the sight of her in the reflection causes Father Losara to name drop Father Albelda from part two. Sounds like he's familiar with the Vatican's work. Knowing that these zombies are actually victims of a viral possession, he's able to hold off their attacks with some holy words and a rosary. Dude's literally living on a prayer. Coldo finally makes it to the control room, too late to find Clara, and too distracted to notice the events of Rex 1 and 2 playing out on the TV behind him. He watches on security cameras as Adrian helps a bunch of people, mostly kids, into a bus to escape. The shadows make it hard to count everyone there, but count them I must, since we see 16 infected people chase them into the bus and eventually get inside. Since I did my best and counted 15 people getting onto the bus, including Adrian, Tita, and Koldo's grandma, I'm adding 31 total deaths to the count right now. Yeah, Koldo, this is a sad one. Koldo sees a reflection of Tristana in the monitor, but when he swings his mace at the figure, it ends up being one of Rafa's friends, the Seth Rollins guy who had played guitar at the ceremony. As for Rafa himself, he's making his way through the building with Clara and Natalie, though they're about to add someone even better to the party. As Rafa and Sponge Guy try to open a gate, Clara tells Natalie that she only invited her to be nice. So, you know, sucks that she actually came. <laughs> yeah, especially because this infected lady behind that window punches through it and bites Natalie. Once again, I'll just count Natalie's death right now, since we don't see her infected form later, and since I stopped caring about consistency about 15 minutes ago. They make it outside into the pouring rain, and as Spongy and Rafa go check on a car, Clara sees her infected mom standing there. Love this sideways long shot of them. La Madre charges at her daughter with intent to bite, but she gets shot in the back by John Esponja, putting her down. That'll do, Sponge. That'll do. Rafa tells Clara there's no time to grieve, since they've got four more infected people making their way towards them. They start to run away, but unfortunately, beloved children's entertainer John Esponja is killed, and he won't be seen infected later. Aw, he'll never return to the mango he lives in beneath the ocean. Rafa and Clara find a hatch that leads underground, but before they head down there, Clara sees five more infected folk headed their way. I think four dudes and a lady, but in any case, they're unable to get to the hatch before it's shut. Clara and Rafa run through an underground tunnel that was so exciting for the filmmakers to find that co-writer Luis Verdejo actually came to set and rewrote parts of the script to better fit the location. Que era perfecto porque era como una pantalla nueva en el videojuego, ¿no? O sea, era como cuando pasas de nivel y el escenario cambia, la luz cambia, los personajes se medio transforman. Clara refuses to head for an exit without Coldo by her side, and she knows her husband is still alive because he just gave her a sign by cranking up the jams. Coldo did always love playing his music loud. Clara grabs a conveniently close by chainsaw and gets to making this movie marketable. Cause ain't too many things cooler than a pissed off bride prepared to kick some ass. Oh. Yeah, my thoughts exactly, Rafa. As with Ready or Not, Clara's wedding dress, designed by Rosa Clairon, was almost treated like another character on set, with nine different versions to use depending on how bloody or dirty they needed it to be. It was actually picked out by Leticia Dolera herself, who came to love the costume, especially after she cuts it down for increased mobility. Para mí es como su traje de superheroína. As Clara heads out to find her love, Coldo returns to the kitchen, where he sees that Atun has slit his wrists rather than be infected by some zombie demons. 
sad to see him gone. Actor Borja Glaze Santa Olea made the character really enjoyable. When Atun's body slumps over, it reveals the OG infected guest, Tio Pepe Victor, who's ready to give the groom his blessings and infectings. They get into a pretty damn good kitchen fight with a gnarly sponsor worthy ending when Coldo sticks an immersion blender into the mouth of his sick Tio and bores a hole straight into his face. They spent a ton of time filming this kitchen fight with actors Diego Martin and Emilio Mencheta doing a lot of the stunts themselves. David Ambic created a dummy of Tio Pepe Victor that Martin actually got to stick the blender into while the crew sprayed fake blood onto his face. But of course, it was left to returning visual effects extraordinaire Alex Villaglasa to combine shots of the real actor with shots of the dummy, all while zombifying the eyes and adding plenty of blood and gore. Although Pepe Victor doesn't go on the count here, since he's already been added, I will go ahead and add the 13 infected slash murder victims Coldo sees in a slow panning shot. I know it's back in the ballroom, so we may have already counted these infected folk, but I also know that y'all love big numbers. Underground, three zombies, two dudes and a lady, have finally caught up to Clara, but she refuses to stand for their shit anymore. She attacks them and puts the lady down in an especially gruesome way when she starts up the chainsaw and cuts her head and hi -ya. Hell yeah, Clara. Oh, watch out for that dude behind you. Oh yeah, karate kick! The last zombie attacks her, but she kills that one by sticking the chainsaw into his torso and then bringing it up cutting his body in half, just like she did that lady zombie's head. Props to Leticia Dolera for taking on all this action. They had brought in a stunt performer for that high kick, but Dolera insisted on doing it herself, since she had trained a lot to make this sequence believable. Claro, como yo soy de tendencia más bien delgada y tal, claro, yo hablé con Paco y digo, nos tenemos que creer que esta tía luego va a coger una sierra mecánica y va a partir cabezas. Entonces lo que, lo que hice fue ir al gimnasio. Y me he cogido entrenador personal. Unfortunately, during all the chaos, Rafa got bit, and he quickly succumbs to the virus right in front of Clara's eyes. She puts the infected Lothario out of his misery by chainsawing his head off. Damn, you don't want to fuck with Clara, y'all. It's her day. I love all these chainsaw kills, and I like how sound designer Gabriel Gutierrez recorded the sound effects for them by literally chainsawing a whole bunch of meat. I much prefer these sounds to what they went with for the zombies, which sometimes sound a bit too much like dinosaurs to me. With her work here done, Clara makes an exit, as behind her, six more infected folk enter the tunnel to give chase. In the kitchen, Coldo arms himself with the cake cutting sword, and then hears his beloved wife below him. He sees that she's at the bottom of that floor grill from earlier, and after he calls out to her, the newlyweds finally get to see each other again. I can't. No, 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 no. But listen, you two, there are still a bunch of infected demon zombies running around, who I'll assume were previously added to the list since I've counted the ballroom twice already. Clara retrieves the multi-tool that was dropped earlier, and Coldo uses it to open the grill before the six cellar zombies can get to Clara. And to make sure they don't follow, she sticks a heel in one of their eyes. At last, husband and wife are able to fully embrace, and I'd honestly be thrilled if this movie ended right now. But we've still got 15 minutes left, so let's just hope they can make it. A bunch of sick people, who I'll once again assume I've already counted, swarm into the kitchen and surround Coldo and Clara. They're just about to accept their fate when Father Losara's voice comes over the speakers reciting a prayer. The holy words stop the demon zombies in their tracks, allowing Coldo and Clara to get away. And thankfully, this place has speakers everywhere, meaning all these infected folk, who again, have most likely already been added to the list, are standing there harmless like a bunch of frozen idiots. Gracias, padre. The husband and wife get outside, and oh boy, yeah, I'm, ju I'm just gonna call it right now, no new kill count additions when it comes to these infected background actors. I've had to have already counted them. And if I haven't, well, you got me, Rec 3. I officially give up counting. Sorry to let you all down, it's just goddamn impossible at this point. But okay, since you asked nicely, I'll count one more infected person. Because we definitely haven't already seen Koldo's grandfather with a hearing aid, who's now confirmed infected and is able to bite Clara because he couldn't hear the prayer. Clara's been bitten, 
but she's not about to give up on her special day. She tells Koldo to sever her arm with the sword before the infection can take control. Though, judging by that reflection of Tristana Medeiros in the sword, it may be too late. Still, hoping for the best, he severs her arm just below the elbow in a violent act of love. <laughs> There were a lot of seamless digital effects throughout this movie, but cutting off Clara's arm was the biggest and most difficult for Alex Villagrasa. Making effects look good in night vision is one thing, but Clara's arm gets cut off in a close-up in broad daylight. To achieve the effect, Leticia Dolera wore a chroma key glove with markers for the computer to track, allowing Villagrasa to remove it and swap in a 3D arm stump. He then had to blend that in with her real arm before adding a bunch of digital blood. Koldo ties off Clara's arm and helps her to the front entrance, where they find that the property has been sealed off by people in hazmat suits. That's bad news on its own, but even worse is that Clara is puking up blood, because turns out the arm severing wasn't enough to save her. Wow, that is just the biggest fucking bummer, brah. Koldo picks up his bride, and despite a megaphone voice telling him to stay inside the premises, he walks out through the plastic tunnel. One last visual nod to the early earlier rec films. When he gets out, he finds a bunch of armed soldiers staring at him. And even though Clara's clearly becoming a demon zombie, he refuses to put her down. Instead, he gives her a kiss, which gets mighty damn bloody after she succumbs to the virus completely and rips out his tongue from his mouth! Flappé! I love the nasty fake tongue they made for this effect, and Diego Martin said it was a perfect way to end the film. It's a moment of orgy, of sangre. Tiros, lengua, prótesis. Fue, fue un gran día y creo que es un, un final que está muy a la altura de, de lo que es esta película. The armed guards open fire, adding Coldo and Clara to the list. I decided to wait a minute and put them on the kill count together, even though Clara technically turned a little bit ago. I mean, the two of them tried so hard to be reunited this entire movie. The least I could do is let them go on the count together, right? That's my thinking anyway. Still wish they could have made it out together somehow. But they didn't, and neither did a lot of other people. How many exactly? Let's find out and get to the number. <laughs> Through my completely arbitrary methods, I counted 161 dead slash infected people in Rec 3. Probably missed a bunch, probably double counted plenty, and who knows what the fuck's going on with that gender distribution. So, you know, forget about it. With a runtime of 80 minutes, that left us with a victim on average every 29.81 seconds. Damn! I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill, collectively, to the chainsaw kills in the tunnel. We had a head splitting in half, a body splitting in half, and a head getting sawed off, all by a kick-ass bride in a wedding dress. Awesome. Dual machete for lamest kill will go to Danilo, since his yoink away and shield slide death seemed a bit too cartoonish to me. And that's it. Rec 3 Genesis was the most difficult movie I've ever had to count and really revealed the limits of the show's whole conceit. And I've got a similar task next week with Rec 4. Fucking great. Until then though, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Rymo66812, SCP343, Silver, John Cheery Chieo, Jillian Tooks, Caitlin Swartz, and Darren Hampton. I know that some people aren't aware, but I do have a Twitch where I stream behind the scenes stuff. I'm literally streaming right now as I film this. I don't have a regular schedule or anything, but check it out at twitch.tv slash deadmejames.